Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's webinar with College Confidential. Um, we're going to be talking um, with three student panelists on how COVID has impacted their college plans, um, along with information about their college and application experiences. So we're really thankful to this um, panel discussion, this panel here today, and thankful to all of you out there for joining us. Um, our session it will be live streamed and we invite you all to join us in our forum as well to share any thoughts and connect with peers on how the coronavirus is impacting you and your college plans. Um, my name is Abby Ford. I'm the Director of Digital Learning um, at Inside Track. Um, and I'm going to introduce our, our panelists here and then we'll dive into some questions um, for them. So um, we've got three panelists. We have Ethan, who's a high school senior from Colorado. Um, who has been accepted to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Duke, Brown, Vanderbilt, and Georgetown, among others. So that's a pretty exciting list. We have Zay, uh, who's a high school senior from Maryland, um, who has recently been accepted off the waitlist at Northwestern and plans to attend there this fall. And we also have Rohan, who is currently finishing his freshman year at Dartmouth um, after having attended high school in India. So thank you all for joining this conversation. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, I'd like to start by getting a feel from everyone on the panel about how coronavirus has affected your college experience. Um, in the case of Ethan and Zay, how did this coronavirus impact your ability to make a college decision? And for Rohan, what kind of um, impact did COVID have on your first year of college? So let's go ahead and we'll start off with Zay, if you're ready to get started. Um, yeah, so for me, I had applied to some schools on the West Coast, and I, after like the whole coronavirus, especially since like uh, a lot of the cases are on the West Coast, I ended up just not like considering any schools on the West Coast. I also put more thought about going to the University of Maryland, because before I had gotten into like some other schools like RPI and NYU, and I had like, those were the schools I preferred, but I thought, University of Maryland was cheaper and closer by, but eventually I, um, especially after I got the wait list off Northwestern, I decided that that was the school I wanted to go to. So I just ended up um, thinking that even though there were a few like coronavirus cases there, I wanted to really go there and I ended up thinking it's the best opportunity for me. So I ended up picking that. In the end. Great, thank you. And Ethan, how about you? How did coronavirus affect your, your choices? Yeah, so it was honestly like quite a struggle for me because I had not visited any of the colleges um, that I was that I considered in the end, um, you know, before like the outbreak or before anything. And so I was kind of banking on the Advent weekends to be able to just explore campus life and the school culture there. Um, and definitely like I'm fortunate in that I wasn't directly affected by coronavirus. And so I don't, I don't want to come across on the wrong foot there, but um, it was kind of a, a struggle for my family to narrow down that search um, in, in spite of um, you know, everything that was going on. And so um, I ended up having to rely on like a lot of other um, resources, um, you know, whether virtual campus tours or, or simply like perusing Google Earth and talking with current students to type get a feel for where I might want to um, select. And so um, I think, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, Corona didn't like completely throw a wrench in my plans and was still able to work around it. And there was a lot of generous people who like offered support to me. Um, but you just had to be, I guess, a, a bit more resourceful in the process. Great, thanks. And Rowan, how about you? Um, how did this affect your first year in college? Right, so that's interesting. So Dartmouth schedule is a little bit different from most of the colleges in that we have a quarter system. I believe Northwestern also has a quarter system. So uh, when we left for spring break, we'd actually finished our second quarter. So unlike a lot of people who like, like exited mid semester and then continued their classes online, I started and finished an uh, entirely new set of classes online. And I can honestly say in comparison to the classes I had before, it was definitely worse, like, with, with, <laughs> like considerably worse. Like it's just a very much less enjoyable college experience for sure. Especially because I'm like been taking them from a house, not my, not my house, but like from a, my aunt and uncle's house, but still, it's pretty definitely less enjoyable. Also, like I had plans for the summer. I had an A and a B plan to do, to do either an internship or an academic program for the summer, either in Washington DC or Tokyo. And those both faded to become, ceased to become options. And, and especially since I had actually like taken the effort to research those and apply to those 
and um, uh, structure those. Um, like the effort I put in and then have to have them be canceled was very much, there's definitely threw a wrench in the plans for my, um, my for finishing up my freshman year. So now I'm not really sure what I'm doing this summer. So uh, it's honestly been a very confusing uh, thing to happen. That's understandable. Um, the, the next question I have um, is for you, Zay. Um, I know that you had a 3.62 GPA and a 1460 SAT, which is pretty, pretty great and pretty high for a lot of people out there. Um, but you, you'd mentioned that you, you, you've considered it low for Northwestern, um, as well as for NYU, where you were also accepted. So can you tell us what you did to differentiate yourself to offset those stats? And it really seems like you've been doing a lot of amazing work. So it'd be great for everyone to hear about how you've how you've been applying your time? Um, so I feel like for computer science, like uh, like you focus a lot on the GPA. So I was kind of worried that my GPA and SAT were low. But I think like the things that really helped were really the fact that I took like a lot of advanced courses. So I took like in my senior year, AP computer science principles, AP chemistry, AP calculus. Um, I also did a lot of like uh, computer science related things outside of school. So I did a free program called Coding with Classy. And uh, you basic, I basically learned how to code apps and develop Swift. So I, I got to learn more languages. And then I also um, was part of robotics club and I ended up doing like becoming the safety captain. So those were things like related to computer science that showed that I had like extra experience outside of school and that I was really interested. And then I also participated in other things like I was student council president. And I also um, uh, did like, bridge club and like beyond the bubble which were like social like committees and help like talking about how we can like improve the school social awareness and I think like having that like wide array of activities that showed that I'm also like really a committed member in the school really helps to show that like um, I was doing a lot of things like and I'm a lot more than the GPA and the SAT and it kind of makes me a more interesting applicant in total. Yeah you were busy that's uh, so much impressive work that you were doing. Um, so it inspires me too. Um, this question's for Ethan. Ethan, you got into a lot of uh, impressive schools. So I wanted to ask which one you chose um, and what was the de deciding factor, particularly as you talked about before, um, considering that you couldn't visit this, you couldn't go on campus tours or visit admitted student days and things of that nature. Yeah, I was really fortunate to have offers from so many great schools and um, it was a tough decision making process to go through. Um, I think one of the biggest factors for me was um, location and sort of the networking opportunities or social life that I might find in college. Um, and so that definitely like swayed me more um, towards certain options over others. Um, and I think, you know, being away from home I, um, outside Colorado was was big for me as well, because um, I just wanted the experience of being kind of immersed in a um, yeah, new area of the country with with students from all around the globe. Um, and so I think uh, in the end, it kind of came down to whether I was going to stay in state uh, and go to Colorado College or CU Boulder on, on this uh, venture scholarship that I was awarded um, or to go out of state. Um, and just for financial reasons, I kind of headed down to Harvard and, and Princeton. Um, and so I, I ended up um, choosing Harvard um, uh, out of those three to four options. Um, and I just really liked kind of their, their emphasis on social life with the house system that you get into uh, sophomore through senior year. And uh, I thought there would be a lot of great um, networking opportunities there, kind of in the heart of Boston and just in this like um, fantastic uh, melting pot of a location. Um, and um, yeah, so the, I think it was, it was kind of a mix of, of what I felt uh, or how the experience I felt would like push me to grow socially and, and in terms of like being in a new part of the country and then also financially Harvard uh, also had a really good package. Um, but I'm just super grateful for all, this, all the schools and the offers and there was a lot of people who helped me on along the way to, um, to make a final decision and um, you know really appreciative for that. Great, thank you. Um, Rohan, this question's for you. So you mentioned you started to talk about this a little bit. So just to drill into um, what your experience was like um, with online learning during the pandemic. And if you have any tips for students who out there who may have to do the same kind of online college courses in the coming year. Right, right. So um, I chose Dartmouth. I chose to apply ED to Dartmouth. I chose them. It was my first choice because of its undergrad focus, its close relationships with professors, the small class sizes, and, you know, the close community. And once you move to online school, 
all those things cease to be really realities. Like even if there were some class sizes were small, it's a teacher talking at you on on online because you can't really hold a discussion w w easily um, uh, online. So it was just it was especially compared to the courses I had before. It was just like much more boring, much more mundane. It was also pass fail, um, which was good, which was good. But I ended up basically skimping a lot just to, just to like get decent grades and so that I don't fail and just get, just trying to get through this experience rather than enjoying it. And there's no discount on tuition as well, which was not which is not great. Um, uh, so paying full tuition for online school was not was just just not, like not the best. So my energy schedule went like down the drain. Or my sorry, my, my energy schedule, my energy levels went down the drain. Um, as for tips, I would say you should you should schedule out your days and weeks such that you put time for academics, but also schedule in um, breaks to like relax, to like check in with your mental state. Because online learning is really Honestly, I found, it, I found it quite stressful. It's just very different being stuck at home and not having so, not really having much of a social life as well. Um, go, go outside, get outside once in a while. Getting fresh air is good. Seeing other people who are, aren't your family is also, is also good to like keep up your mental, mental state, keep your spirit. You should call your friends as often as possible. Like that would be what I would say uh, would be my tips for taking online classes. Great, thank you. Um, definitely a different different learning experience. So, um, so this next question is for the whole panel. Uh, in terms of getting accepted to college, can you talk about um, what advice you have for students who are preparing to apply now? For instance, do you have any tips about extracurriculars, college tours, anything else um, to help those who are going to be going into this process soon? So Zay, can we start with you? So I understand that like a lot of people might be like sad that they can like maybe visit colleges before they apply, but I'm I'm actually like not sure like that's the thing to do. I think you should just apply where you want to and then end up like hopefully like by the time you get into your colleges, you can visit them and see like help them pick your choice. And so then also that way, maybe it doesn't like limit like which ones you want. Like before I visited Northwestern, I kind of didn't want to apply, um, but like, I ended up getting to visit later on and then I liked it. So I, sometimes I think like, or if you visit, it might not always be a good idea or it could be a good idea depending on like who you are. And then also for extracurriculars, I like also know that because of the coronavirus, like a lot of people's like summer plans have been canceled, um, but there's still a lot of online things you can do. So like if you go onto like Coursera or even if you like go on the College Confidential website, you can find so many different online things. Like even me, like I'm doing like an online like Google CSSI computer science program. It's like a great thing to add to my resume and it's all on online. Um, and I'm also taking like a Chinese class and these are like great things I can add to my resume that still like beef up my extracurriculars, but it's all from my house. So I, I really don't think that the stay at home orders or anything like that should like deter anyone from like fixing, figuring out how to like, you know, make their resume look good for college. Great, thanks. Ethan, over to you. What do you, what, what, what do you have to add to the, to help for the, those who are going to be applying for college soon? So, um, you know, I think uh, it's my, like my biggest piece of advice is not when you're kind of formulating your extracurriculars or, or coming up with how you want to be involved in high school, because I think all of that, you should just kind of follow your heart and, and um, do whatever um, you really want to explore or what you're passionate about. But I think the biggest advice I could offer is it comes to that second stage when you're figuring out how to present yourself um, to, uh, through your application. Um, it's kind of crazy to think about, but you know, you, you pour countless hours into standardized testing, extracurriculars, all of these different, you know, um, non-tangibles. And, um, you know, sometimes it's only a couple minutes that the admission committee looks at your application. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just kind of, you know, the, the way the system works currently. But um, in order to, I guess, um, yeah, to, uh, to package yourself in the most concise uh, and compelling manner possible, I think you have to devote some time to thinking about, you know, what is the common thread that, uh, or how could I sew a common thread through all my extracurriculars or um, through my involvement in high school to, to illustrate who I am and how could I translate to that to how I want to be on campus. Um, the, the best way I found to do that was to um, just kind of think about what theme that I want to convey through my essays. Um, and you can boil that down to just a couple words or even a, a full sentence that illustrates 
what you want to study, how that ties to maybe a, a personal attribute and what change that, um, or what, what change you hope to bring about in the future. And that could be on like a very in our personal scale, it could be a global scale, whatever is, is most compelling to you. I think coming up with that theme and, and making sure that um, it's, it's clear through your essays how all of your different involvement illustrates that um, is, is the biggest um, piece of advice that I would have. Great, thank you. And, and Rohan, you, you have a, a year, it's been a year since you've done this-ish. Um, so what, that, what, what perspective can you provide now given that you're in college and you can kind of look back on it with a little bit of distance? Right, right. So I think looking back at when, when I was applying and presenting myself and also looking at the people who are with me, like at, at Dartmouth, I would say that when you're formulating like what extracurriculars, extracurriculars to choose, like I would argue against doing a little bit of everything. That's what a lot of people try to do. You got to write, they, they want you to like, I don't know, write for the school newspaper, do a sport, um, uh, do the, I don't know, English, the, do the reading club, uh, like they, or do a reading club, do, do, a, do a science project. And I honestly think that that's definitely the wrong way to go. I think that colleges, I, I, one, of, one of my classmates who works in the admissions office told me this as well, but I think that colleges um, look for, they want to create a class, they want to create a, create a well-rounded class, not a class of well-rounded individuals. What that means is they want a class of people who each have like, they want a class of people with different like intellectual pursuits are things that they're passionate about. Not a, not a class of people who do a little bit of everything and not don't go so deep into them. I think that when you're picking extracurriculars to do, uh, make sure you have a bunch related to your field of interest and then dive deep into them. Even if they're just two or three, dive deep into them. For liberal arts schools, it's also good to like do a couple other things to show that you're interested in more than one subject. But I think you also need to, at the same time, need to keep in mind that, you, that specialization is key in like one or two areas. For me, that was like, I, I didn't, it doesn't have to be one. For me, it was like environmental studies and journalism. Um, but I honestly think you really need to zero in on the areas of, in, of your areas of interest and like make sure you have, go deeply into, into those, get leadership positions and extracurriculars related to those and stuff like that. Like, yeah, just don't do a bit of everything because you, you probably won't like most of what you're doing. It's very unrewarding and it, I don't think it'll help you to go get into college either. Great. You each provided really different perspectives, so I appreciate all of your, your thoughts on that. Um, the next question is for you, Ethan. I understand you had an internship in high school. Um, how did you go about getting that opportunity, and what was it like to juggle it with your responsibilities? Definitely. Um, you know, I think internships, they're kind of like this scary thing to talk about for um, a lot of people, myself included, who, you know, Weren't, weren't sure how you get your foot in the door. Um, it's tough because companies sometimes expect you to have past experience and rightly so, because it it's uh, they're taking on a risk to hire somebody. Um, but if you don't have any past experience to draw on to get the first internship, it's kind of like this negative feedback loop. So um, kind of breaking that cycle and, and like getting your, uh, uh, or dipping your toes in the first internship is a struggle and it, it was for me, but the biggest um, thing that I could recommend for people is to, um, to work on personal personal projects and this may be because I'm more like geared towards tech and um, that tends to be a field that is like really uh, what do you say like uh, are that anybody can kind of um, you know play around with and gain experience in through their own projects but I think it, whether it's through like school clubs or like formal competitions maybe launching a few projects in your areas of interest to um, to build out some relevant schools is a good way to or relevant uh, skills is a good way to build out a portfolio that will be attractive to employers um, and so the first strategy that I would recommend if, if you're looking for an internship is just to reach out directly to someone's HR department. Um, there's sometimes that they will have like postings directly for high schoolers, but um, just personally, and, and this might only be my case, um, I've seen like a, a much larger number geared towards undergraduates. Um, and so typically if you like apply through the portal and uh, you're still in high school, I think oftentimes your application can even like get to the review stage. And so I like just reaching out directly over email, um, just a, sh a short kind of bio, maybe even that theme that you're trying to develop for your application, um, introduce yourself with a, a one page resume um, and ask if you know, they're, they're open to high school interns. So that's kind of the strategy that I took and ended up working out for the first internship. Um, and then after that, once you, you have some experience already, uh, there's definitely like it opens the, uh, what do you pay the floodgates for a lot more opportunities. Um, there's, there's a lot of like research programs that are geared towards high schoolers. I'm a bit, uh, or I would throw out like some discretion around um, paid programs, you know, because I think uh, sometimes it can be easy to get taken advantage of if you're doing work for someone, but yet you're paying them. And I, I'm not at all bashing those because I think there's a lot of good opportunities there to receive mentorship. 
Um, but I also think it's, uh, you should definitely like, you know, keep an eye out for paid opportunities as well as paying opportunities. Um, so d definitely like you could look towards those like paid summer pro or the summer programs where you have to pay uh, or internships where you have to pay. But um, I, I tend to prefer the route of just working with a company. Um, and then, you know, I think internships are a great way to gauge like possible areas of, of study or just to ex explore something that you might want to do after college. Um, and so they're a fantastic resource if you want to um, use them to, yeah, to, to learn about um, your interests and to explore that in like a real world environment. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, I know it's a scary process, but um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's just about the amount of work you put in and I'm sure everybody here is like deserving of one and can, um, you know, there, there'd be somebody willing to hire them. Great, thank you so much. Um, moving over to you, Zay. Um, next question is about um, the. Uh, it, I know you were accepted off the wait list, which is kind of what everybody hopes for if they're on, a, um, you know, on a wait list at a school that they want to attend. So I wanted to ask whether you did anything in the meantime, such as sending in extra essays to Northwestern or submitting any other materials that might have been able to move the needle um, and make your way off the wait the wait list. Um, amid a, pand a pandemic, which, you know, where you couldn't tour or demonstrate your interest in another way? Yeah. So I got like a few different recommendations. So I, I think my original application, I sent like two recommendations to Northwestern, but I had like four or five recommendations like I had used for different universities. So I just sent them like another one of my recommendations from one of like my um, mentors um, from one of the internships I had. And like that I sent them that and then also like after uh, I got the waitlist update for Northwestern I had gotten accepted to the Google CSSI program and it's like this competitive program for like people for um, seniors about to become undergrads who are doing computer science and so I also like mentioned that that like I was now participating in it and then I talked about also I think what I was doing as like a student council president um, during the pandemic, like the kind of difficulties I was like overcoming, like still trying to make sure that like people were having a good time for the rest of the year and like how complicated that was. And I think that like interested them because it showed that even like through this pandemic, like I was still something, I was still trying to like show how interested I am. And I think that helped them like, like I hopefully think like help them decide that they should accept me off the wait list. Well, it seems like it worked. So good, good work. Um, so uh, Rohan, the next question is for you. Um, as a student applying um, from a high school in India, you have a unique experience to share. Um, what do you, advice do you have for students who are who may be applying from abroad? Uh, from abroad? Well, the first part of advice I'd have for them is slightly more general. Like uh, just like um, Ethan, I also did not get the chance to tour any schools. Um, it's quite expensive to travel all the way to America for school for touring schools. Um, uh, so I did not do that. Um, I would say so the first part of my advice for applicants applying from abroad is research, research, research. Like, uh, and inherent in that is first of all, throw rank out the window. Like if you're applying to selective schools, they're all have a pretty similar quality of education. Like honestly, difference between the first, the, the number one ranked school, number 25th ranked school is pretty much arbitrary in my opinion. The rankings are self-fulfilling prophecies. They're based on like uh, a large a lot part of them is based on acceptance rates and reviews from other schools, which is pretty bad, pretty biased in my opinion. So I would say look for the things that you think are important that you want in your college experience and are important for your college experience and look for the schools where they're available. Um, if that's a highly selective Ivy League school, then sure, go for it. If that's if it's if it's not, then still go for it. That's the, that's the kind of school you want. For me, I wanted like a close community. I wanted I I felt like I need a flourish better. I went to a traditional Indian school uh, up till tenth grade, and then went to an international boarding school. In the boarding school, I got much smaller class sizes, much closer relationships with my with my teachers. And I knew that I felt like I needed that, that I wanted that for my college experience. I like I. And my boarding school, we had a very close, tight-knit community. I felt like I wanted that in my college experience as well. Um, yeah, and I also wanted to do more than one study abroad. I wanted to have a flexible schedule rather than just like, I wanted a flexible schedule. So like the course system made sense. So they're not, those things, that list of things are not available at just every school, right? They're not available at, they're not available at some of those schools that are like the highest, the highest ranked because those rankings are not, are, are not, subject are not objective, right? The, the different schools will have different educational values for different people. 
So you need to look for the things that you think are important to your college experience. For, for me, all those factors lined up at Dartmouth, but just because Dartmouth is a highly ranked school doesn't mean it will be the best fit for you. You have to look for the schools that literally, that have all the things that you think you feel like you want and need in the college experience and then go for, go for those schools and avoid, uh, please avoid US News or Forbes or any of the rank rankings because those will, will those are not at all relevant to you to what to what you want from the college experience because what you want is very highly subjective no matter who you are great great tip so it sounds like really know what you want coming in and, and search yeah. for those things it's just important for international students because most times you don't get yeah. the chance to tour and you have to like make your case uh mm -hmm. from a, from abroad so it's, it's i think it's much more important for national students to like list out what they want and then look for those look for those schools online because a lot of times people may people in the u.s who will get the chance to tour may not know exactly what they want and then go to the schools and then feel like it's right which works for them but it doesn't may not work for international students right okay great thank you for that um so the next question is um for anybody who wants to answer um did any of you receive scholarship money and um if so can you explain a little bit about how that process went um so i can go ahead and Ethan, it looks like you unmuted. Do you have experience with that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I typically like tend to break down aid into two categories. One's more merit-based, and so this could include like outside scholarships or maybe um, student designations that the college might give you for um, for like a high enough GPA or like a if you're selected as like a scholar at the school. Um, and then the other type is need-based. Um, and so I think need-based, that's just going to depend on, on your fa like family's financial circumstances. And so I don't know that there's like too much advice that I could lend um, in that department. One thing that I would say, and which ended up being helpful for me, was negotiating offers with colleges. And so without getting into the specifics, um, you know, the, my need-based aid varied drastically between different colleges. Um, so there's, uh, there are some schools that, that I had to pay nearly three times as much to attend and they were both out-of-state private than others, um, simply in merit aid. That's because they had a different formula for calculating it. Um, but by, you know, working with, uh, there were two um, financial aid departments I work with in particular, and just by kind of telling them my situation, uh, letting them know that I had other offers, they were able to bring it down substantially, uh, or the, the net cost per year. And so I would recommend that uh, for those who are applying for um, need-based aid and who have multiple offers. Um, as, when it comes to merit-based aid, so I kind of put most of my, um, what do you say, the eggs in one basket um, with this in-state scholarship called the Betcher. And so this is only for Colorado residents, but it's like a full ride to any in-state school. Um, and I know other states have similar full ride programs. Um, so I would um, look into those because that was a really solid option for me. Um, it was like a fantastic um, opportunity. And I was really fortunate to get if I did choose to stay in Colorado. Um, so I would recommend uh, merit-based scholarships. There's, there's some just by generous foundations that are willing to give you full rides. And then there's others that are like smaller awards that could be uh, applied to any college in the country. Um, and so I did one that was through the National Merit Corporation and just uh, my mom's employer. Um, she had a program that selected students with a high enough um, score and like who had written essays and stuff. Um, so just looking out for those is really important. Um, and with the, the National Merit Corporation in particular, I think studying for your PSATs, putting as much uh, effort as you can into that, at an early stage, I think it's your junior year that you take it. Um, I would I would really recommend that because uh, it can save you money down the line. There's a lot of good resources for scholarships, and I know sometimes like after you finish the big push um, in fall for your college applications, you kind of want to slow down. But if you can, you know, reuse some of those essays, write a couple new ones for your scholarships, you can end up saving a lot of money. Um, and I'd recommend it because there's just so many awesome opportunities out there that are you know waiting for people to apply to. Zay, I see you unmuted. Thank you, Ethan. Feel free to, to run with that. Um, so I think my advice for the scholarships is that uh, people especially should like, if you want some of the bigger scholarships, that you should start early. So I had like known about outside scholarships before because another program I did called BSTEM had mentioned it, but I started really late. So I could only apply to like, like some of the smaller kind of scholarships, like maybe that are like 500 or 1000, but there are like bigger scholarships, like from big corporations, like Burger King or McDonald's, Taco Bell, Coca-Cola. And those applications start in like, I think like they start opening in August and September. And I would really suggest people like look at them because sometimes the applications aren't that hard. They kind of even like go along with like your college applications, like the kind of essays you have to write and everything you need to download. And it's just like something like you can, I guess you can do along with your thing. And like, 
some of these um, scholarships you can apply to any university you go to you get like 20,000 scholarships obviously they're really competitive but like I, I actually know like quite a few people especially for my least stem program that got a lot of them um, me on the other hand like I didn't get as many outside scholarships but I did get uh, quite a few uh, in-state scholarships so Northwestern doesn't do merit aid scholarships they only do financial aid but uh, for like RPI and also I think um, Juniata, Pittsburgh and some of the other schools I got into uh, I got like quite a few like in-state scholarships for like either like the SAT score, GPA, um, you know, also like I'm a minority woman so I got some for that. I also got like scholarships for doing robotics because I did like a community event so they also gave me scholarships for that. Um, and also for some of these schools you can get like random things that a lot of people aren't looking like if you actually go into databases and look into it you could be getting scholarships because you're left-handed or six foot tall or something random that a lot of people like tend to ignore and they're like not you so it's basically like money that's waiting for there for you to get, have access to. So many good tips in there. Thank you, Zay. Um, uh, the, Ethan, the, the next question is um, for you. When you, you had so many options to, when picking a college, can you share some, some information about how many schools you applied to in total? And um, if you created a list of safeties, matches, and reaches, how did you approach that? Sure. Um, so I definitely applied to a large number. Um, I did 23 colleges in total. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend that for people necessarily. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly can't give like a clear answer as to how many you should apply to because um, there are advantages to, you know, doing over 20. There's advantages to narrowing it down the list further. And I know Ron mentioned that he did uh, early decision to, to Dartmouth. And, like I absolutely recommend that for people too if, if they want to commit, you know, to one school and they know which one they're interested in. Um, the reason that I um, applied to so many was that I really wasn't sure what I was looking for in terms of school fit. And so um, I don't know, like, I guess it's a bit of a cautionary tale. Like I would encourage other people to like do more research than I did before entering the process. Um, and I'm really fortunate, you know, how everything worked out, but I think um, I should have just done done more reflecting. Um, and the, the main factors I would consider like location is, is the biggest one for me personally. And I know other people, you know, have different opinions on that, but in my, in my opinion, like, location really like factors into, um, you know, just a lot of, uh, a lot of aspects that, that determine like school culture and it's I guess it's hard to like distill down ex into exactly how that works or to distill exactly how that works but you know I just think like it, it affects the architecture it affects like whether it's rural or urban and um, just maybe what some of the backgrounds people are coming from and so that was um, something that I I wasn't sure about location and how that would factor into school fit but um, so I kind of just applied everywhere uh, or every geographic area in the country um, uh, you, so your question also mentioned like like breaking down the schools into different groups based on selectivity. Um, so I, I would say that I kind of avoided that. Um, my my thought process was more so like what are the schools that I would be interested in attending, you know, if I did get in, would I seriously consider it? And it just so happened that there were like over 20 that I, you know, really liked. Um, and part of that maybe I wasn't like, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. Um, but part of it too was just that I was open-minded, I guess. Like uh, I wasn't against being maybe in the countryside or I wasn't against being in the city. Like I was fine with small, like uh, small or large, you know, I didn't get the chance to tour some of the Ivy League colleges I was considering, but um, there's, there's one in my city called Colorado College, which I really love. That's like a small liberal arts school that has this very unique curriculum. Uh, and then there's this gigantic public school called CU Boulder in my state as well that I spent a summer at. And um, to be honest, I just like loved the culture at both. And so um, I just, I found that, I guess my preferences were open in terms of college fits and um, you know so if, if you're in that situation and people are telling you to narrow down your list you know there's there's um, good reason to do that but there's also good reason to say you know like I guess I'm gonna dream big you know and I, I could see myself anywhere so I'm gonna apply to a wide range um, but I think yeah there's there's definitely like uh, an argument to be made that you should have definite schools that you know you you'll, you can get into or that you have a like likely chance of getting into um, and so you know to go back to that example of CU Boulder um, I was fairly confident that I would be able to get in, and I also really liked it there. So that was like a good, like you know, safety or safety school. I don't like the labels, but I think that was kind of a good go-to for me. Um, and then you know, I just pretty much applied to all other like really selective schools because I knew that I would be fine going to see Boulder if, yeah, uh, I got rejected from the other ones, and uh, I would be happy there. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Let me look over it again. Uh, so how did I craft my list? Yeah, I just think uh, Ron mentioned like earlier research was like a big factor in him. Uh, helping determine like where he wanted to apply since he couldn't visit. And I would corroborate that by saying that 
um, for me, yeah, just like talking with current students was really helpful. Um, and that was more so, I guess, in the decision process rather than the application process, but um, you can get a good feel for like what people's experiences were there. And um, usually they have like a few factors or like themes that they took away from their college experience, which to them uh, illustrate like how, how it was distinct from other college experiences um, or what they felt like the school culture was. And I think asking the current students is the best way to learn out, uh, learn about it. Um, and then I use UVisit and Google Earth a lot, which are two tools just to learn about campuses. So um, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but I just said to wrap it up. Um, you know, uh, don't be afraid to apply to a large number of schools if you don't know what you want. If you do know what you want, feel free to narrow it down. Um, and yeah, just be open-minded to like different options. I just wanted to tag on to it. So one thing uh, Ethan said there, like I wanted to emphasize that you have to be very careful to pick the unique factors in a school and mention those in your application. Because I know a lot of people whose dreams, whose dream schools were like, I don't know, Stanford, because they had like the number one, they had a great computer science program and they know they have a great computer science program. It's something like there are plenty of schools with good computer science programs. So telling them you want to go there just because a computer science program isn't really, wouldn't really make a good case for yourself. Like if you can, if you write an, a supplement essay for a school and you could very easily uh, like control F, find the name of the school, replace it with the name of another school and it would work for the other school. And that is, that is a bad essay. I just wanted to, just wanted to emphasize that. Like we make sure to take the applications to the school, to the school, to the school. That's just general application advice for everyone. Great, great point. Thank you. Um, Zay, it, for you, it sounds like you have so many varied interests, um, including fencing and the arts, and you mentioned computer science, so many things. Can you share how you chose your major of computer science and whether it was important for you to look at schools that also allowed you to pursue other interests simultaneously? So like last year, I actually wanted to do um, civil and environmental engineering, but then I did this like research program at the university of Maryland and I did like research with like PhD environmental engineering students and I realized that it's actually not what I wanted to do at all. I realized I didn't like it. And so when I did like coding with Classy, I realized that computer science actually fit me a lot better and it's more of uh, we might have lost say for a moment. Zay, if you can hear us, I'm going to ask that question again in just a moment. Quite a few people uh, who apply to computer science because they're just like, it makes a lot of money or they, they want to do like biology and do pre-med because it makes a lot of money. But like, I really think like for college, you should apply to a major that you actually want to do, that you're actually passionate about. Because I think sometimes like colleges, like no, like if you don't really care and if you really don't want to do it. And so like, that's why I, I picked computer science because I really liked it. And I also ended up picking Northwestern because I really like the computer science program. And also because I could do like other things like film and stuff because I, I also had like a YouTube channel and I liked film so I could do both of the things I really liked, which was important to me. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, uh, okay, so, Rohan, flipping back to the, the um, uh, I think either you or, or mentioned, you may have mentioned earlier that you applied to Dartmouth Early Decision. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about that. Um, can you explain why you applied Early Decision and what advice you have for a student who is on the fence about whether or not to send that, that kind of application into a college? Sure, sure, definitely. Um, I honestly don't think there's a bad side to applying early decision. I think there's literally no no negatives to applying early to a, to a college. Like honestly, I was not 100%. I love Dartmouth. It was one of my top choices for sure, but it was not I was not 100% set on Dartmouth. It was one of my very top choices along with a couple other schools. Um and I honestly when deciding to apply early decision I looked at a bunch of factors. Look, I looked at where I was the best fit for, fit for like which schools I was the best fit for, where, where I could tailor my application to uh, make a good a good case for myself, given I never visited the schools, um, and also which schools I would be very happy to attend. And I ended up with with um, with first three schools, and I narrowed it down to two, which I would which I would like if I got into one of those two or three schools. Um, no matter what other schools I got into, I would 100% commit to one of those two or three schools, like no doubt. And I ended up honestly for fairly like, it was fairly random uh, pick choosing to apply early decision to Dartmouth. I felt I could make a most compelling case for myself there. I also felt it was a good fit for me. 
Um, uh, but I, it was fairly arbitrary compared to, um, to for picking Dartmouth over, uh, for example, Yale, which is one of my other uh, top choices um, um, to apply early to. And the reason I think that there's no downside to applying to school early, even if you're not 100% set on the school, is because first of all, if first of all, the admission chances are greatly greatly raised. Like even if you factor in factor in all that the fact that there's a high proportion of legacies and a high proportion of um, uh, an, a high portion of the people who get in early decision are recruited athletes, then your admission chances are still at least double at, all, at these schools compared to the regular decision round, which is a huge boost. And if, if you get in and they don't fulfill your financial aid, then you can actually just tell them you haven't fulfilled my financial aid, they haven't given me the financial aid I need and, and reject that offer. There's like, I honestly, I, again, I really don't see a downside to, a, to, a, to applying early, early to a school it's just it makes the mo it makes complete sense. Like if you're especially if you're applying to a very selective school, then you you this is your one shot to double your chances. Um, like yeah, it's 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 just way better for you. I mean honestly, I think the only one thing I one caveat I'd say is that you should make sure that the school you apply early decision is at least one of the schools that you would 100% commit to. Um, you like one of the set of schools that you 100% commit to if you if you got in relative to the rest of your choices. That's the only caveat I'd say. Otherwise, I think I think everyone should apply early decision. Honestly, it it makes way it makes way more sense to apply early decision than not to. I mean, the only way I mean, if you're not completely not sure about which college you want to go to, then then maybe just don't apply early decision. But otherwise, if you have an idea, I think there's no downside to it. Great, thank you so much. All right, our next question is for everybody here. Um, I wanted to ask all three of you what your expect expectations are for the fall. Are you seeing anything suggesting what kind of experience you may be positioned to have um, in the fall semester? Um, how about we start with Zay, if you're able. So I'm like constantly checking the Northwestern website and like um, I had told Rohan before it's like basically it looks like they're just trying to phase in like the most essential people but as far as I can tell like I think most students are supposed to come back on campus but we're supposed to do it like um, like in a staggering way like students uh, different students come back uh, different days or different weeks and also I, I don't assume they're going to do like all the traditions they usually do like there's a lot of like first year traditions like going under the arch and stuff but obviously they want to keep like students away from each other and I also think like students might have to take some of the classes like virtually and in person like a mix to kind of keep students apart but like as far as I can tell I still think they're trying to go with everyone getting back on campus eventually. Oops, sorry, I was unmuted. <laughs> or, um, Ethan, what are you hearing from, from Harvard? Um, so I would give an answer, but um, I honestly don't really know because I know they're like still kind of figuring out. They said in July they'd have something. So I don't want to give any false info. Um, so I'll pass it to Ron. Got it. And Rohan, you've, you've, you've already been here for a quarter. Do you have any sense of what the fall will look like? A year, actually, but yeah. Um, there's a rumor going around they'll be just be freshmen and seniors because seniors because their last year and freshmen to protect their yield. But honestly, like they canceled a lot of freshman traditions um, for for the incoming class. I mean, they don't have trips, which is such a our trips, our trips, our first trips are very unique. And we have a lot of um, quirky things that we're not really supposed to talk about that we do nothing, nothing illicit, nothing inappropriate. But it's just really it's a really fun introduction to the college. And Honestly, like I know, I I'm mentoring a 24, um, um, and and helping the, and helping them through the intro process, and they're strongly considering um, deferring admission because they don't have all the introductory traditions, like a lot, like any like there there'll be no parties pretty much for the entire for the entirety of, of the fall quarter. They're closing all the all the Greek houses, all the societies that hold parties. Um, there are no there are going to be no very large gatherings pretty much. So it's so even if I'm allowed on campus, I'm a rising sophomore, even if I'm allowed on campus, it will definitely not be the Dartmouth experience I know and the Dartmouth experience that I chose to come to this school for. So I don't, honestly, I, I don't particularly expect to come back on campus. And even if I do, it will not be uh, 
the kind of college experience I'm particularly want. So I'm probably going to take my fall quarter off. Luckily, we have the quarter system, so I can do that. So I'll probably take the quarter off and then keep taking quarters off until we get to come back on campus in like the full, um, the, in like the come back to campus in the com with the complete experience that we usually have. Honestly, I, I couldn't could not like it would be painful to me to not have that personally, you know, having experienced that already. All right. Well, um, this has uh, been a really, really wonderful conversation um, where I want to take some time to thank Zay, Ethan, and Rohan for joining us today and sharing your experience with us. And we learned so much from you. So we're just very grateful for your time. And um, I know we're in really challenging times societally. And I just wish you all the best of luck as we kind of figure out what next year looks like. And um, just again, want to very much um, appreciate you for being here and for all of you out there um, in the internet listening in or watching later. Thank you also for your time. So um, we'll go ahead and wrap up unless I think I might hand it over to Devin, um, our marketing person for just a quick sec. Anything you want to add, Devin, before we wrap? No, thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to continue the discussion in our forums on collegeconfidential.com. Have a great night. <laughs>